Okay, well, I think we'll get started. So um, welcome to the Exact Solutions uh, first session for the Marcel Grossman meeting. So there are going to be two sessions, uh, one now and also one on Friday morning uh, European time. So this is the first one and we're going to try to keep to schedule. So please raise your hand or type a question in the, in the chat screen if you have a question uh, that you'd like asked at the end of the talk. So I welcome our first speaker, Tina Harriet, who's going to talk about three parameter solution for the null surface formulation in two plus one dimensions. And let me first uh, unmute you, Tina. Okay. Can you say something? Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Excellent. <laughs> okay. Uh, should, am I free to share my screen now? Yes, please do. Okay. Thank you. Okay. That, so that should be visible, I believe. Yes, that's all good. You're good okay, to go. Okay, thank you. So thank you very much for joining uh, this talk, which, um, as Dr. Scott said, is about the null surface formulation of general relativity, or NSF for short. Um, this work was completed with my colleague, Dr. Jeff Williams from Brandon University. What I will do is talk briefly about uh, exactly what NSF is, uh, then describe a little bit more detail the two plus one version of it, uh, present an exact solution and discuss its properties. So NSF is an alternative formulation of general relativity, but can be shown to be entirely equivalent to it. It was introduced in the mid 1990s by Ted Newman's group in Pittsburgh. And at the time they hoped that it might provide insights into things like gravitational lensing and singularity issues. Um, as we all know that the central role in general relativity is played by the metric tensor. And once one knows the metric, one can formulate the null surfaces. NSF takes exactly the opposite approach. The central role is played by the null surfaces. And if one so desires, one can uh, calculate the, the metric. One immediate problem with NSF was that the equations were extremely difficult to solve. In fact, there is no known solution of the three plus one version. And so in 2000, a number of people, including a group led by Cosme, introduced the two plus one version of the theory. However, this too proved extremely difficult to solve with the first solution only being found in 2014. And since then, we found two subsequent solutions and I'm presenting just the fourth known solution here today. So in order to understand what's involved in finding solutions in the two plus one NSF, um, I'm going to give a few more details. And one begins by introducing a function u equals z that will represent the families of null surfaces. The function is of the space-time coordinates xa and a parameter phi which will label the surfaces. And of course, the principal requirement for those surfaces now defined by z equal constant are that they are going to be null with respect to some space-time metric. At this point, it's convenient to change coordinates to what are called intrinsic coordinates because they're naturally adapted to the surfaces. These coordinates are labeled u, omega, and rho. U is equal to z itself, and omega and rho 
are the first and second derivatives with respect to the parameter of z holding the space-time coordinates fixed. So one must impose conditions on Z to ensure that a solution exists. And these conditions are called metristic conditions. And they're found by repeatedly differentiating this equation shown here, which is the usual equation uh, ensuring that a function, uh, in this case Z, is null. It turns out that in terms of the intrinsic coordinates, these metricity conditions are most simply expressed in terms of a function which we denote by lambda, which is the third derivative of z with respect to the parameter phi. The metric can be recovered and written entirely in terms of this function lambda and a second function that will be defined shortly called omega. One finds that one has to solve three subcoupled equations. The first is shown here and is called the main metricity condition. You can see it's a rather nasty third order nonlinear equation um, in, in lambda and the three intrinsic variables where the operator del is shown in magenta um, is given by this expression here when it acts on a function phi of the intrinsic variables and the parameter phi. The second equation uh, introduces the function omega um, and together these two equations guarantee that the surfaces determined by lambda will indeed be null as is required with respect to some space-time metric. And of course, once one has lambda, you can in principle integrate three times to recover the null surface itself. The third equation is the equation that when satisfied along with the other two guarantees that the two plus one Einstein equations are also satisfied. And one can see that using this function omega it determines the rho rho component of the stress energy tensor. So turning to how one finds solutions, one begins with the main metricity condition. Um, and one obvious way perhaps to try and solve this nasty looking equation is to reduce the number of variables on which lambda uh, depends. And in fact, this is how we found the very first solution in 2014 by assuming that lambda depended only on the coordinate rho. However, here we take a different approach um, by looking at the form of this operator del, we, we thought of looking for additively separable solutions for lambda. Specifically, we chose this form, minus a omega plus an as yet unknown function of rho plus au, where a is a constant that appears in these two places. And the coordinates rho plus au appear only in that combination, which we will now write for x uh, as x for convenience. The beauty of this form is that it um, causes some of the terms in the main metricity condition to cancel. But more importantly, it converts this third order nonlinear partial differential equation into an ordinary differential equation shown here. Now, it also looks rather nasty, but it can in fact be integrated uh, most easily by writing y is the function h to the two thirds. It can then be integrated twice, uh, and these constants k. <coughs> and A shown here arise from those first two integrations. The, the now first order equation can be integrated a third time to express Y implicitly as a function of X by this expression given here. This is an elliptic integral, but unfortunately of the kind that cannot be inverted to allow y to be explicitly written as a function of x. However, 
we do not need this to continue. <clears throat> so what we have done so far is got an exact expression for lambda that satisfies the main metricity condition. And the form of lambda is shown here in magenta. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so now we turn to the second equation to be solved. Um, we have our form for lambda and with a simple assumption that omega depends on rho and u only in the combination in which they appear in lambda, it is easy to show that omega equal to y to the half satisfies the second metricity condition. <clears throat> Having got um, lambda and omega, one can always write the metric in terms of those two functions. And the general expression is shown here. And you can now understand a little better what the omega is. It arises as a conformal factor of the metric and is in fact equal to the g omega omega component. For our particular solution, the metric appears as shown here. <coughs> <laughs> Excuse me. And with the metric tensor, we can, of course, now calculate the Ricci tensor shown here, where we introduce one final uh, shorthand notation, W equal to A plus 8A, Y to the minus one. <clears throat> when one is seeking new solutions, it's, of course, important to determine if that solution is really new or um, a previously known solution in a different set of coordinates. One way to help with that determination is to find the independent curvature scalars of which there are just three in two plus one. The first is the Ricci scalar itself shown here <clears throat> in terms of the three constants. The other two are shown here and can be written in terms of R and the constant A. <clears throat> there was a third NSF equation to solve, and we can now show that it is indeed um, satisfied. With our Ricci tensor and scalar, we can calculate the Einstein components, of course, and in particular, the row row component, which turns out to be W y to the minus two over four. The third NSF equation here determines the row row component of the stress energy tensor given omega. And for our omega, the row row component turns out to indeed be the G row row divided by kappa. And so we have satisfied the third NSF equation. So we can turn to look at the solution properties. <clears throat> and following Alice, um, one can calculate the expansion shear and vorticity scalars from the expressions given here in terms of the projection tensor H and a velocity vector U. There is, of course, some freedom to choose the velocity vector, but this form here is a useful one. And it gives us zero expansion, but non zero and non constant shear and vorticity scalars. Again, following Ellis, one can now look for the source uh, term. The stress energy tensor shown here, mu is the usual mass energy density, P the isotropic pressure, Q the heat flux vector, and pi ij the anisotropic pressure. Of course, when these last three terms are zero, if q and pi is zero, then we recover a perfect fluid source. <clears throat> For this solution, the isotropic pressure and the mass density are shown here. They're both non-constant. But for this solution, we also have non-zero heat flux and anisotropic pressure. So this source is indeed a perfect fluid. The heat flux vector is shown here, and it does obey the usual temperature gradient law identically. However, the anisotropic pressure term 
does not satisfy um, this equation, which is often uh, stated where there's a, a simple relationship between pi and the shear tensor. Um, but following McCallum, that simply suggests that the anisotropic pressure term is not small in this case. Um, Tina, five minutes. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm almost done. <laughs> so uh, in conclusion, uh, what I have shown here is just the fourth known solution of NSF and the first with an imperfect fluid uh, source. It satisfies the weak, uh, the strong and the null energy conditions, and it depends on all three intrinsic variables. In addition, it depends on three constants. Um, and perhaps one of the most interesting things about this solution is that it contains two of our previous solutions as special cases. If one sets the small a to zero, you can see here that immediately lambda reduces to a function of rho only, the 2014 solution. If one sets the capital A, which appears here in the expression for uh, y to zero, then we recover the 2018 solution. And finally, we have examined the other regions defined by this um, diagram. But unfortunately, none of the others are particularly uh, interesting. Uh, two, two are flat and one is conformally flat. Um, if we have only um, uh, the uppercase A uh, non-zero, then there is a new solution, but it, it does not satisfy the energy conditions. Um, if we have K being not uh, zero, but the other two non-zero, it turns out we actually just have a different form of the first solution that we found. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tina. Um, now, <laughs> is there, are there any questions? I can't see any hand up. Um, I might ask a, a question um, in that, last Venn diagram you, you had up, Tina, mm -hmm. um, you mentioned there were four solutions altogether. So there's one that's not included there. Yes. Um, <laughs> how does that fit with the, um, the ones? Well, uh, that's a very, very good question. Um, the, 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 the fourth solution, which we found in 2019, is, is different in that it depends multiplicatively on the um, intrinsic coordinates. And so, you, you know, it, it just does not fit here at all. Um, but in, in some ways it is um, the most interesting solution because we're looking ultimately to solve the three plus one version um, where we will need to have um, the, in, the intrinsic coordinates appear multiplicatively because one has to cons consider the spin weight of these um, coordinates uh, in three plus one and the, the lambda function has to be of spin weight too. And so, um, uh, so, so, so that's why that, that uh, fourth solution does not appear here. Okay, um, any other questions? I mean, I, I suppose where you're heading at the moment is you're you're looking for a solution of the four dimensional situation. Yes, yes, that's right. That's right. And unfortunately, it, it's sort of um, exponentially harder, um, not just because of another dimension, but um, because of the role played by the spin weight um, of, of the uh, coordinates and, and the way that you have to combine them. And also the, the del operator becomes something called the f operator, which is also much more complicated than the, than the linear operator that we have here in, in two plus one dimensions. Fantastic. Well, um, best of luck with that. Uh, hope Thank to hear you. About A sabbatical month. project. <laughs> Okay, well, Tina, I'll ask you I to will stop. stop sharing. <laughs> Thank you.
Mm. Okay, so uh, I'm now going to I'm now going to introduce our second speaker, Syed Nakvi, and he's going to be talking about freely falling bodies in standing wave space time. Now I'll just unmute you first. If I can find you here again. Oh yes, there you are, of course. Can you say something? Oh, uh, hello. Yeah, perfect. Okay, well, you're free to um, start sharing your screen and can begin. Okay, so. So, okay, so I'll begin. Okay, so uh, hello everyone. I am uh, Sayed Nakvi. I am a PhD student at the Astronomical Observatory of the Jagiellonian University. It's in Krakow in Poland and originally I'm from India. So uh, the this is the work which I have done with my uh, supervisor, Sebastian Shipka. So the title of our paper and the this presentation is same. It is freely falling bodies in standing wave space time. So the idea is to understand, uh, see an exact solution of Einstein field equations, which has standing waves and uh, see how particles behave in it. And on your right, if you see that you have a, so this is a cartoon type image that you have two waves, right? So you can superimpose them if you are in the, let's say mechanical setting or electromagnetic setting. But if you are superimposing two waves in general relativity, then there are some non-linearities to take into account. So uh, the idea would be to see what these non-linearities non are in the space-time which we study, which is an example of a Gaudi uh, space-time. So uh, first, I'll quickly go through the linearized gravity, which we all know, and something about gravitational wave memory. Then I will talk about like how gravitational waves, they are also studied as exact solutions to Einstein field equations and how memory is studied in them. Then I will try to motivate how, uh, what standing gravitational waves are. And then the finally, the aim would be to have you, me, and all, let's say, freely falling observers immersed in this space time and see how the geodesics uh, behave. So the basic linearized regime, we know that uh, to describe the geometry, you obviously need your four coordinates and the metric is uh, in this form. And the, uh, the basic regime in how you study gravitational waves is that you, there is a, uh, some source which is very far. And on the flag space time, what you can do is that you can perturb the flag space time metric and uh, you can plug this into the Einstein field equations and you can get the linearized Einstein field equations far from the source which is box h alpha beta x equal to zero, where box is the Delambertian operator. Since this is a plane wave equation, you get the plane wave solutions like this with the polarization terms uh, of the h plus and the h cross. And the effective uh, way to study like what is the effect of the, uh, of the gravitational wave on the geodesics is to study the displacement vector, which you do by the geodesic deviation equation. And let's say if, if, for example, there is a gravitational wave perpendicular to your screen right now, and if you have a ring of particles, it will go in the plus and the uh, X uh, polarizing state as shown over here. Now, uh, actually what happens is that uh, when a gravitational wave passes a ring of test masses, so it should generally, what we study is that originally it returns to the original state that it returns to the initial configuration over here, but in actually there is uh, some, uh, some sort of memory left, which is actually a permanent change in the configuration of the space time after a gravitational wave has passed. So there is this permanent change either in the displacement or the velocity of the particle. And uh, this has been uh, studied recently, but the issue is that right now the size of this memory is like one order magnitude smaller than the oscillatory waveform. So uh, this is being studied and with more and more uh, detections, this will become, uh, this will become important because it, 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 gives a, it, it gives you a glimpse of the nonlinear nature of general relativities. And uh, what the different kinds of memory are, one is the linear memory, which was studied by Zeldovich, Polnareff, and Braginsky and Grishchuk. So uh, they were studying uh, the linear memory way back. So uh, their memory term was arising that it was due to the change in the value of the quadrupole moment. So more specifically, the reduced quadrupole moment when it is different at the asymptotic value. So if there are uh, for configurations where the binary is in, let's say, a hyperbolic orbit, or if there is some asymmetric supernova explosion, or there is some gamma ray burst, then there might be this linear memory term coming into uh, in your age, which is the 
which is the gravitational strain. Similarly, gravitational wave memory was studied in a nonlinear form, originally by Christodoulou in the, in the full nonlinear theory. It was studied as a time integral of the entire past history of the source. Then in the post-Newtonian approximation, it was studied by Damore and Blanquet. So they studied it as the stress energy distribution of gravitational waves. So here the basic idea is that nonlinear memory is coming due to the change in the mass of the binary caused by the emission of gravitational waves. So when you take the T mu of the gravitational waves itself and plug it into the Einstein field equations, you get the nonlinear memory term. And we know that from long back, gravitational waves were studied as some exact plane wave space time. So you have the, uh, the, the, the wave nature inbuilt into the metric and you study it that. So you study exact solutions of Einstein field equations, which may be used to model radiation moving at the speed of light. So these were known as PP uh, wave space times by Ehlers and Kundut, where P and P stats for uh, plane wave and parallel propagation. Initially, there were like obviously the Brinkman coordinates in 1925, where the wave like nature is inbuilt in this function H. And a special case of that is the plane wave space times, which we study now. And also, I'll just uh, speak a bit about how memory is studied in exact plane wave space time. So recently, Zhang, Duval, and Gibbons in this paper, they uh, took the Brinkman coordinates uh, over here. And here, the main guy is this function, uh, is this profile of the wave, Kij. Okay. And now, when you uh, you take a particular form of the uh, form of this wave, so the waves produced by gravitational collapse modeled as sandwich wave was studied by uh, these guys. So you plug this over here and you just study the normal uh, geodesic equation. And the basic idea is that they studied the geodesics in Brinkman coordinates for particles initially at rest. So you study this for two different uh, profiles over here. The basic idea is that, okay, if this is the X direction and this is the Y direction, you, you have a set of parallel geodesics. So in the black dotted thing, this is the wave. So after the interaction uh, with the wave, the, partic the, the particles, they fly away with some residual velocity left. So yes. they found out that these uh, particles are initially at rest. Yeah, yeah. But, but after the wave has passed, they move away with constant non-zero relative velocity, which is they termed as the velocity memory effect. So recently, memory has been studied in this form that you have some different form of wave profiles over here, and you study the geodesics in, uh, in that picture. But now back to standing gravitational waves. So originally what was happening was it was Sir Herman Bondi who was studying the gravitational waves of unsymmetric body rotating around the z-axis. So he was trying to superimpose gravitational waves in study. But the issue was that if you take non-linearities into account, then the lack of superposition principle, it was complicating the studies. Then almost a decade ago, it was Hans Stephanie who formulated this question that are there standing gravitational wave solutions of vacuum Einstein equations? So his idea was that you can look for exact solutions in which the consecutive parts of the metric functions, they maybe depend on some time-like coordinate through a periodic factor. And the other thing was that, okay, you can have an analog of the pointing vector should be divergence free. But the issue was that uh, in this picture, what was happening is that this was not uh, covariant. So you can refer to these paper over here. So if one has to define standing gravitational waves, so intuitively we can think that, okay, if there are two gravitational wave interacting, so there would be nodes and anti-nodes form, right? So standing wave may imply an alternating energy flow through the nodes, which averages to zero over here. But uh, first of all, the energy of gravitational waves cannot be localized. So you need a covariant averaging procedure. So it turns out that in this paper by Shipka and C.S. Lick and standing waves in GR, that in the high frequency limit, you can capture the dominant contribution of the average energy flow. And then if your space time satisfies these two conditions, then you can treat that as standing gravitational wave space time. So a space time containing contains standing gravitational waves if it belongs to a one parameter family of space times uh, satisfying the green wall assumption. And then your Ricky tensor should be of a surge type, which is another classification of your space time. So with this in mind, we study this form of Gaudi matrix. So this metric represents a universe, which is, uh, which is an expanding universe. And there are just and just gravitational waves and they're interacting and forming gravitation. Uh, they are forming standing gravitational waves. The main characters here are this function F and P, which are functions of T and Z, which means that T is the cosmic time and Z dependence shows that the gravitational wave is in the Z direction. So, and 
uh, the coordinates z and x and y they are periodic say so they go from 0 to 2 pi and the particular solution we are interested in is uh, given by this so you plug them into the einstein field equations so you get uh, like dependencies on like bessel functions and etc but the main things are beta and lambda beta controls the amplitude of the gravitational wave and lambda controls the number of the waves so if you if this is one of the plot of p that okay initially uh, there are these waves of higher amplitude but as the universe this uh, evolves in time the amplitude decreases so the initial conditions are crucial in order to analyze what is happening uh, in this space time and now what is the topology of uh, this space time which i am discussing right now it's actually a donut so it's the more uh, officially it is known as a t3 gaudi model which is a polarized three torus so here you see that if you join the two opposite sides of a square tie you will get a two torus but three torus is you take the opposite sides of a cube and then you get a three torus over there so the amplitude of the wave decreases as the universe uh, expands so we studied the geodesic equation and found that it has stationary solutions at the antinodes and it is at the antinodes we try to study the behavior of freely falling bodies so before we uh, go further i would like to uh, like you to imagine like what is how is it to live in a 3d uh, not 3d in t3 uh, model so you can imagine that you are having a vr set and you are inside a t3 geometry a three torus geometry and you are playing a game of catch the video did not play okay present let me see i can try once again otherwise it's fine yeah so you can imagine right now that you are in this space time and uh, which is t3 which is a torus so imagine that uh, there's a periodic conditions right zero uh, x and y goes to zero pi so your ball is on your left hand and if you throw it in one direction because it is periodic you will get in the other direction so this is how the gravitational waves are interacting and forming the uh, the standing gravitational waves and the idea is like first we study the geodesic equation so you can imagine for a second that right now you are in flat space time and there are some parallel geodesics in the z direction and now you switch on this gaudi space time so this is actually what uh, you will see that the geodesics are getting attracted at these anti nodes and this agrees very well with the intuitive picture right because if there is standing gravitational waves so at the anti nodes would be accumulation of gravitational wave energy which would imply some sort some sort of attraction so this is how the geodesics are getting attracted at the anti node so this agreed very well with our intuitive picture that uh, that that at the anti nodes the particles will get attracted so this is what we found and so this is a plot of z versus the proper time and this is the attraction of the anti nodes so when we found out the uh, stationary solutions at the anti nodes so now you have to imagine that me you and all the freely falling observers we are freely falling here and we will try to observe a ring of test masses via the geodesic deviation equation so first of all what are the components of the xyz uh, the geodesic deviation equation so we took a freely falling frame and in an orthonormal frame we studied the geodesic deviation equation so it turns out that the equations they decoupled and the motion of the test particles could be studied in the transverse direction which is the xy and the longitudinal direction which is the z so if you study this z equation the, i mean the deviation in z we get something like this that the trajectories of initially stationary test particles these are near the anti node so you imagine that at the z direction the this displacement vector in z it initially increases and then it decreases and it the particle sort of flies by from the anti node and at the uh, and now the idea is to understand that okay me and you are freely falling at the anti nodes how a ring of test masses would uh, behave over here so here what we see is that okay this is you falling at the anti node you will observe two uh, different rings of uh, masses uh, two different rings of test particles which are at which actually signify different initial conditions and you will see that they will evolve into a permanent ellipse so these two rings of particles uh, initially at rest they later permanently deformed into an ellipse and obviously the wave is in the z direction and you are studying the geodesic deviation equation in x and y and the shift in the initial condition this alters the long range behavior of the trajectories and reveals the plus polarization so this is only the one polarization which we have so now the usual picture of gravitational waves which we know is that the initial and the final configuration is same but here because we are studying an exact solution in full totality is that's why we get this uh, memory effect for us uh, spa uh, space time 
for this Gaudi space-time idea. And so this was the Tissot plot, which shows how a ring of test particle will behave for slightly different initial conditions. So there are these lambda and beta, which controls the number and the attitude of the wave. Now also, uh, we uh, did the Newman-Penrose analysis for our space-time with obviously the help of frame fields. So frame fields are essentially mathematical techniques which you use to investigate the space-time. And these correspond to a family of ideal observers immersed in a given space-time. So right now, uh, when I, you... I, 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 Five minutes. Yes. Okay, yeah. And uh, uh, so uh, this, uh, so in this, we performed a Newman-Penrose analysis of our space-time. So you generally work with a Nell tetrad, and this formulation formalism is well suited uh, for studying how uh, radiation propagates in the curved space-time. So you have the Weyl scalars, which the physical interpretation is that okay, the psi two term represents the Coulomb term, psi one, psi three represents to the ingoing and the outgoing longitudinal radiation term, and psi zero and psi four represents the transverse radiation term. And now we try to see what these terms mean for our space time. So in our space time, what we found is that first of all, our gravitational wave can be studied or uh, as a non-trivial superposition of two waves moving in the opposite spatial directions. So the Coulomb part is not zero. The longitudinal part is zero and the transverse effect is obviously not zero. So here in this space time at the antinodes, if you have a ring of test masses, you will see that the, uh, the masses will get deformed in uh, the, sp the sphere of test masses will get deformed into an ellipsoid. The ring of test masses will just get uh, into an ellipse. So that uh, the important thing is that the longitudinal effect in our space time is happening due to the Coulomb part and not due to the longitudinal part of the vibe. So to conclude, I would just say that you cannot uh, trivially superimpose gravitational waves. There are some nonlinear effects. One is the velocity memory effect, which we found. And the other effect we found is the longitudinal effect, which is due to the Coulomb part of the Y. And the future work uh, would be to understand electromagnetic waves coupled uh, to gravity. So I'll stop here. And this is the reference. OK, thank you very much. Um... So firstly, I will ask if there are any uh, questions. Yes, I've got Indranil has got his hand raised. Uh, I, I, um, do I need to unmute you? I think I do. Let's see if I can do that. Um, can you try speaking, please? Yeah. Hi, Sayed. Okay. Yeah, hi. yeah, nice job. Man. So I wanted to know, so in the Gaudi space time that you showed, right? Mm -hmm. You showed it is for an expanding universe, right? Yeah. So, so what is the matter content, or you are using a positive cosmological? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I should have specified more. I went too fast. So, first of all, this is just a vacuum solution, right? There is no uh, T mu nu here. There are only just these gravitational waves. They are interacting, and the nature is inbuilt in these functions f and p. So, this is just a vacuum solution. Okay, but and then how do you motivate it? Is an expanding one. Exp Expanding universe comes from over here. If you look at uh, this part of the metric, it's like in how you study in uh, FLRW metric, right? You have the function A as a function of T multiplied by dx square, dy square, and that thing. So here, this F is a function of time and Z. So that's why this universe is just expanding and there is just gravitational waves and nothing else. Okay. Okay, okay thanks. Okay. Any other questions? I might just ask a general question. I mean, obviously, we're always interested in different ways of detecting uh, gravitational wave and gravitational wave effects. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you? Wh what are the? Um, what are the ways we could go about detecting this memory effect uh, using, you know, sort of detectors or interferometers on Earth? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, right now, obviously, in uh, for this, uh, for the ground-based detectors, the advanced LIGO, Virgo, and now Kagara, the uh, because first of all, the mirrors are not actually free; they are like hanging from a pendulum. Yes. So the, the the idea to detect gravitational wave memory there. So recently, what people have done is that you need a number of detections and you stack them, and then you can probably see this effect. But uh, the issue is that you need around, I think, more than uh, more uh, not around, but more more than thousand detections in order to have this effect on the ground based detectors for space based uh, detectors i think it uh, i think it would be possible to detect because there you actually have the free test masses yes well in either case we're going to be waiting quite some time to yeah. satisfy one of those two conditions <laughs> yeah okay well thank you so much for your talk Sian. that was uh, great and uh, we're you. going to move on to the next speaker now 
So I'd like to introduce Marie-Noelle Solerier, and she's going to be talking hello. about... Hello. <laughs> hello, how are you, Susan? <laughs> nice to, to see you, even from re remote, but it's uh, nice to see you're fine. It's very good to see you as well. Um, and in fact, you're the one speaker we couldn't check up with prior to the session. So I'm very, very pleased to see you here now. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so you're going to be talking to us about new exact stationary cylindrical anisotropic fluid solution of GR. Yes. So I'll get you to share your screen. Yes, I'm going to do that. Çayım var bir tane mi öyle? What? 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 I can see a screen, but it 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 may not be. It's but a sort it's of not. It's not my. It's not my slides. No, it's a Firefox. Well, thing. I think that probably to share the screen, you must use the the Zoom app, not the the browser. Um, yeah, there's a green screen. button that says share screen uh, at the bottom. Let's just share it. I mean, if if you are using the browser, you cannot share the screen. Look at it in the um, Zoom thing, the thing, the blue thing with the white camera on it. If you look in that, there's a screen. Just, no, just let me. Uh, just have to. Here they are. You see it? That's looking better. My, and my slides. Yeah, if you go full screen now. Fine. Here I am. Sorry for the delay. Have you got your video on? Yes. That's fine for you with you. Yeah, except I can't see you on the, the speaker side of the panel. Have you got your video on? Yes, you, you don't see me on the speaker? Yes. Uh, yeah, you're all good. Yes. Okay, yes. everything's fine. Okay, everything's I, I'm fine. going on. Yes, well, hello, uh, everybody. Hello, uh, the organizers for giving me the opportunity to present this talk in the framework of the 16th Marcel Grossman meeting. And second, I would like to say that I will restrict my talk to uh, the presentation of the rigidly rotating exact solution. Uh, since in my abstract, I was uh, I had also uh, uh, tentatively talk, talked about uh, some uh, analysis of the non-rigidly rotating case, but uh, because of lack of time, I won't speak uh, about this. Uh, you can find in my articles and only of the uh, rigidly rotating case. Then my, the, the plan of my talk will be as follow. Uh, after a short introduction, I will present the cylindrical space-time inside the source. And uh, uh, afterwards, I will uh, exhibit the rigidly rotating new solution to the Einstein equation and uh, their physical properties, and then I come to my conclusion. Uh, the work I'm going to present is a continuation of a couple of previous ones. The first one was a preliminary study of uh, rigidly rotating stationary cylindrical anisotropic fluids by uh, Debash et al., and that was published in GRG in 2006. The second one was a generalization to non-rigid rotation 
and uh, deeper analysis of the analysis of the rigid uh, uh, case with an emphasis on gravito electromagnetic properties and this was uh, published by myself and sentence in PRD last year. And the new uh, result I want to present is an exact solution to the GRFIL equations for a rigidly rotating fluid with a particular but a physically meaningful equation of state. And I will also uh, explain physical properties. The general uh, stress energy tensor of uh, the cylindrical space time inside the source is, uh, as you can see it, with the uh, rho being the energy density, PR, P phi, and PZ be being the principal stresses. V alpha is the four velocity of the fluid, and it is time-like. And K alpha and S alpha are uh, space-like orthogonal uh, four vectors. The line element for this uh, stationary cylindrical symmetric space-time is uh, this, with the uh, F, K, and mu, and L being uh, functions of the coordinate, radial coordinate R only because of cylindrical symmetry. And uh, the coordinates uh, are uh, bounded by these ranges and these limits. Uh, and of course, phi uh, is uh, the, the, these limits for phi are topologically identified. I, I will present this new solution. Uh, the equation of state of the fluid is as follows. It's uh, rather simple uh, to allow me to integrate the equation, the field equations. Uh, I ch have uh, chosen uh, PR and P5 to vanish, and I've denoted uh, the ratio PZ over rho as H of R. I work in a co-rotating frame where the four velocity of the fluid uh, is written like this. And since it is uh, time-like, we have this constraint on the V parameter. S alpha, uh, one of the uh, space-like uh, four vector orthogonal to V, uh, has this form and K alpha vanishes. I also define uh, some uh, function uh, D squared uh, which will be of use uh, for the uh, resolution of uh, the field equations. Here they are. Uh, there are five of them. Uh, since there are only uh, five non-vanishing uh, uh, components of the Einstein tensor, the first one uh, corresponds to G00, this one for, to G03, G11, G22, and G33. And I will use also the Bianchi identity that in that case is rather simple and will allow me to integrate part of the equations. Now to solve the field equations, I make a particular choice of issuing for an arbitrary uh, constraint on the vial tensor components, but we have uh, no uh, no consequence on the on the resolution of the uh, field equations. It's uh, only a trick uh, to uh, ease uh, the resolution. And here is a this choice, uh, which allows me to integrate uh, the mu exponential, and C mu is the integration constant for uh, this part. Uh, I insert this equation into Bianchi, and I find this equation which can also be integrated for f with cf another integration constant 
and then uh, G00 combined with G03 gives me this equation for K and the more general solution for K at this form where you see that D prime over D uh, intervene. And I've got first some interim results, uh, an integration uh, for d squared. All, all, those, all those come from the integration of the remaining uh, Einstein equations. d squared is uh, written like this with a new integration constant, c beta and c k. Uh, in inserting uh, d squared into k, uh, here, uh, I obtain this expression for the k function, and L is obtained from the definition of the function d squared, since we already know f and k. Then, uh, I, to ensure uh, elementary flatness in the vicinity of the axis of rotation, uh, I have uh, to uh, impose a regularity conditions on the axis of symmetry. And this gives me <laughs> some uh, constraints on the uh, uh, metric functions and their derivatives uh, at on the axis. This sign means that we take the values at uh, the radial uh, coordinate r equals zero and that is on the axis and all these conditions imply some uh, constraint on uh, the distance related by these four equations and which reduces their number to three because because uh, Previously, they were seven. Uh, I have also to impose the, the matching conditions uh, to uh, the boundary of my system, which is uh, cylindr cylindrical uh, surface sigma. Uh, for this, uh, since my uh, system is stationary, I choose the Weyl class of the Lewis metric uh, to represent the exterior vacuum space-time. This is how the line element looks like. With the four uh, metric functions written as functions of the R coordinate like this, using three uh, independent uh, integration constants. Then I come to the Damos uh, junction condition, and this uh, happened to be this condition on the sigma surface. And PR equals zero is very easy to implement in my case because uh, remember uh, in the equation of state. Uh, I already uh, assumed that PR was vanishing everywhere. Therefore, uh, this condition is fulfilled by the solution. And here, in the final form of this solution, uh, when I use the uh, relations between the integration constants, uh, the four uh, metric functions are uh, given as functions of the H of R function and of uh, two of the uh, integration constant, H0 and CK. I have also an integral uh, equation to determine the H of R uh, function implicitly as a function of R. And as a bonus, we have also a uh, which is given by this expression as a function of h, h0, and the integration constants h0 and c, and of course of the gravitational constant. Now I come to uh, the analysis, analysis of uh, some physical properties of this solution. 
excuse me. Uh, first, uh, I've calculated the hydrodynamical uh, tensor vectors and scalars of uh, the solution. I only uh, present the scalars, but uh, if you're interested in uh, the other parts of these hydrodynamical uh, properties, you can go to the paper. The acceleration vector modulus of this form and it is a function of a, always this h function and some of the integration constants. And the rotation scalar squared at this form, and it is a function of h and of the three integration constants. Um, five minutes to go. Fine, I, I, will, I will make it. Then, the, as uh, it is uh, mandatory for rigid rotation, the shear vanishes, and this is uh, implemented by the solution. Now, uh, I, in, we, this, uh, this solution exhibits some uh, singularity. The first one is for h equal plus 1. Here, the whole matrix set diverges and the density vanishes, and, but does not change sign. And this is uh, assimilated to a coordinate singularity in the physics for p z equal rho is stable. The second singularity is more awkward. It uh, happens for h equal minus 1. Here, the density rho diverges and changes sign. And I propose to call this cylinder crossing because it has the same features as the shell crossing which are encountered in the spherical symmetry. And the, the, the main functions here only L diverges, but and Pz uh, equal minus rho with uh, this pressure which was negative changes sign, which was negative between h equal 0 and h equal minus 1 change the sign uh, with the row and goes back to being positive. Uh, the integration constant h0 uh, uh, is seen to be the value of h on the axis of symmetry. I show this rapidly. Here you see that if h equal h0, this integral vanishes and also rho vanishes. Therefore, we are on the axis. However, uh, H0 equal 1 implies the vanishing of the whole set of metric functions and is therefore forbidden. Uh, the metric signature, uh, which has been chosen to be minus plus plus plus, uh, implies sign constraints on the validity range of H over R, but I have no time left to show. I don't seem, think I have. So I come to my conclusion. Uh, the gravitational source we have uh, examined is the stationary, rigidly rotating, cylindrical, anisotropic, and fluid, with a pressure directed along the axis of symmetry. We have found a new solution to the GR field equation for the interior non-vacuum space-time match to an exterior stationary Lewis vacuum of the Weyl class. Uh, I have analyzed uh, some physical properties, the hydrodynamical scalars, vectors, and tensors, the singularities, and I have exhibited some cylinder crossing. I have interpreted and discussed the meaning of the H0 integration constant. And for future works, there are many. Uh, I will begin with the, the interpretation of the two other integration constants and the identific identification of the associated different classes of solution. And also, I would like to uh, learn more about cylinder crossing and all the other properties. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Um, we've got time for one quick question, if anybody um, has one. I just like to ask a bit uh, about the cylinder crossing. Um, I'm not sure I understand exactly what that means, Marie-Noël. Well, uh, it's uh, <coughs> uh, 
uh, I, I go back to shell crossing in uh, in uh, spherical symmetry because mm -hmm. uh, in spherical symmetry, when uh, when you uh, go to this locus uh, called uh, shell crossing, that is uh, the uh, the space time uh, the, the the shells which are the, the same energy density uh, are uh, 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 coming together such that the the energy density diverges and uh, they are said to be crossing because the energy density changes sign and then when you you cross the the, the shell the shells then this uh, uh, the same um, physical uh, well, and then it's an analogy to the caustics, you know. Yep. yep. And in cylinder, uh, well, uh, I had the same pro uh, the, the same uh, phenomenon. Uh, you cross the cylinders, the the energy density changes sign, and this is like some kind of a caustics in the cylinders. Okay, fantastic. Thank you so much for your uh, talk. And can I ask you to please stop sharing yes. your screen? Yes. Okay, while we're uh, doing excuse that. Excuse me. Uh, okay. Fine. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. <laughs> so um, our next speaker is Theodorus Nakas. And he's going to talk about analytic and localized brain world black holes. Um, please start sharing your screen. Are you, could you say something? Are you, you must be muted. Okay, let's sort that out. Um, can you say something now? Hi. <laughs> okay, perfect. Can you see the slides? Yes, we can. Everything's ready to go. Okay. Hello, everyone. Before I begin, I would like to thank the organizers for making this event possible. Uh, as you can see, my name is uh, Theodoros Nakas and I'm a PhD student at the University of Ioannina. Today, I will be talking about analytic and localized brain world black holes. The outline of my talk is the following. At first, I will describe briefly the randall sandrum model. Then, we will see the reason why it is uh, difficult to obtain black hole solutions in uh, these types of models. And in the rest of my talk, I will show you how we can construct the, from uh, first principles, the geometry, <clears throat> of analytic and localized brain world black holes. <clears throat> uh, my talk is based on this paper, which was done in collaboration with uh, my advisor, Panagiota Kadim, who is a professor at the University of Ioannina. So, in 1999, Lisa Randall and uh, Raman Sandrum published uh, their model in uh, physical review letters, which uh, looks like this. Their model is a five-dimensional gravitational model with a warped extra dimension, which is confined by two four-dimensional brains. Uh, due to this warping of the extra dimension, objects closer to our brain, namely the brain on the right, appear exponentially larger and exponentially lighter. Using this particular characteristic of the bulk spacetime, Randall and Sandrum were able to solve in a purely geometrical way the hierarchy problem. What is even more remarkable is that they managed to show that even if in the case that even in the case of a single brain and an infinite extra dimension, an observer on the brain will still perceive gravity as four dimensional. In this case where the extra dimension is infinite, we have the so-called Aris 2 model. In what follows, whenever I refer to the Aris model, I will always mean the Aris 2 model. So it is now natural to wonder how we can obtain black hole solutions in such a model. This is what Chablin, Hawking and Trial tried to achieve in 2000. Uh, to this uh, end, they replaced the four dimensional part of the RS metric with the Schwarzschild geometry, 
and they obtain the line, the line element that you show here, that you see here. The Kretschmann scalar of the above metric postulates the existence of a singularity at r equals zero, but due to this exponential coefficient, the black hole singularity extends into the bulk from minus to plus infinity along the extra dimension. Therefore, the above line element generates the topology of a black string solution rather than the topology of a black hole. So, how can we get localized black holes? To answer this question, one can work numerically or analytically. In the literature, there are various numerical solutions, but uh, despite the countless attempts, no analytic solution has been constructed so far, describing simultaneously both the bulk and the brain geometry of a five-dimensional black hole. In what follows, I will talk about how we can construct from first principles the geometry of a five-dimensional black hole, which reduces to a Schwarzschild solution on the brain. The algorithm is the following. In step one, we write the four-dimensional part of the RS line element in spherical coordinates. Then we introduce a new bulk coordinate Z in this way in order to make the five-dimensional space-time conformally flat. In step three, we perform the change of variables that you see here in order to introduce higher dimensional spherical symmetry. Notice here that if we forget about this conformal factor, the metric inside the brackets describes exactly a five-dimensional spherical symmetric space-time. Here you can see the geometrical setup of the five-dimensional space-time. The three brain, our world, uh, uh, which is our world, uh, consists of uh, the coordinates t, r, theta, and phi. Z is uh, the extra dimension, while the coordinates rho and chi are the coordinates which were used in order to, to introduce the higher dimensional spherical symmetry. Having introduced the desired symmetry, we now modify the metric as Schwarzschild, which means that we add by hand the function f of rho inside the metric. Here, we have chosen f of rho to be 1 minus 2m over rho. Finally, we express the, the previous line element in the original coordinates, namely tr, theta, phi, and y, and uh, once after some calculations, should obtain this uh, result. Although this metric looks like a mess, I claim that this is precisely the metric which describes the geometry of a five-dimensional localized brain world black hole solution. Let us examine why. First of all, at y equals zero, where the three brain is located, the above line element reduces to the Schwarzschild solution, as you can see here. On the other hand, at the space-time boundary, where y goes to plus or minus infinity, the above metric takes this form, which means that the space-time is asymptotically ADS5 and therefore incorporates the Randall-Sandro model. To obtain a better understanding of the space-time geometry, we need to evaluate sure in various instances you can hear the rich scalar. The first term is attributed to the negative cosmological constant in the bulk, while the second term is sourced by the mass M, which is located on the brain. A space-time singularity arises only at the points where the denominator of the second term diverges. Uh, this happens at r equals zero and y equals zero. At any other point of either the bulk or the brain, the space-time remains regular. The overall behavior of the rich scalar uh, becomes apparent from these two figures. As you can see in the left figure, the black hole singularity resides strictly on the brain at y equals zero and at r equals zero. And uh, as we move away from the brain or at large distances away from the brain, along the brain, the space-time becomes ADS5. Uh, the other two scalar quantities exhibit a similar behavior as the rich scalar. And uh, therefore, uh, we have shown that uh, uh, the five-dimensional geometry uh, 
that uh, which uh, were constructed uh, step by step, which was constructed uh, step by step, uh, describes the geometry of uh, a black hole solution localized on the brain connected to an H5 boundary. Although uh, the singularity of the black hole remains localized on the brain, the black hole horizon doesn't need to do so. To determine the topology of the black hole horizon, we study the causal structure of the bulk time as it is defined by the light cone. For this purpose, we consider radial trajectories in the five-dimensional background. For a fixed value y naught of the extra dimension, the condition d s squared equals zero with it to this relation, where the function f of r comma y naught is given by this expression. Uh, we observe that as r infinity, the function f of r comma y naught goes to the unity and uh, the fraction dt over dr equals plus or minus one, as expected. However, at a finite distance rh, which is defined through the relation f of rh comma y naught equals zero, we obtain dt over dr equals plus or minus infinity. Therefore, at y equals y zero and r equals rh, we encounter the black horizon as it, as it extends into the bulb. As you can see from this relation on the brain, where y naught equals zero, rh equals the Schwarzschild to m independently of the value of k. But as we move along the extra dimension, rh shrinks exponentially fast and becomes zero away from the brain. What we just described can be summarized in these two figures, where you can see the exponential suppression of the black hole horizon along the extra dimension. Here, the depicted brain coordinates are the radial coordinate r and the angular coordinate phi. Uh, let us now determine the bulk matter which is necessary to support our solution. To do we consider the five dimensional action functional that you see here and uh, then this action functional with respect to the metal tensor we obtain the gravitational field equations from which the stretch of the tensor by doing so we deduce that the necessary matter content in the bulk is an anisotropic fluid described by this uh, stress energy tensor here rho e is the energy density rho uh, p theta is uh, the tangential pressure, um is the fluid's time like phi velocity, pr is the radial pressure, and xm is a space like unit vector. Here you can see the graphs of the energy density and the tangential pressure in terms of the extra dimension y. Notice that for this particular value of uh, the black hole mass, region one lies inside the black hole horizon, while the region 2 is the causal region of the space-time. On the brain located at y equals 0, the energy density and the pressure adopt which satisfy all energy conditions, while outside the black hole horizon, both the energy density and the outside the horizon is effectively ADS5. Uh, having determined the bulk matter, it is now important to specify the matter on the brain. In the brain, in the brain world scenario, which was formulated above, our four-dimensional world is described by a three brain embedded in the five-dimensional space-time at y equals zero. The induced metric on the brain is given by this expression, and as in all brain world scenarios, we decompose the total energy momentum tensor into the bulk and the brain components. The, the brain stress energy tensor can be further decomposed like this. Uh, sigma here is the vacuum energy or tension of the brain, while tau mu nu encodes all the other possible sources of energy and pressure in the brain. From the Israel's Jackson conditions at y equals zero, we find that uh, in order to embed our four-dimensional brain into 
the five-dimensional space-time, uh, no additional matter is necessary, uh, but uh, while the brain tension is uh, given by this uh, expression. Uh, finally, we need to study the effective theory on the brain and uh, to do so, we apply the same procedure as in this paper. Uh, by doing so, one can uh, determine the effective four-dimensional gravitational field equations on the three brain. Uh, after a lot of uh, tedious uh, calculations, one should get this result, which uh, postulates that the effective four-dimensional Einstein tensor on the brain is identically zero. This is indeed the anticipated result since the induced line element on the brain is described by the Schwarzschild geometry, which is a vacuum solution. Um, five minutes to go. Thank you. Summing up, we have uh, successfully constructed from first principles the geometry of an analytic five-dimensional black hole, which uh, is exponentially localized close to our three brain. We have demonstrated that the black hole singularity lies entirely on the brain, while the event horizon extends into the bulk, but it is exponentially suppressed as we move along the extra dimension. The five-dimensional line element reduces to the Schwarzschild solution on the, on the brain, and it is effectively ADS5 outside the event horizon. Also, no additional matter needs to be introduced on the brain for its consistent embedding in the bulk. However, we haven't found the explicit field theory which is able to support our black hole solution in the bulk, and uh, also, we haven't studied the stability of our solution. Therefore, in the future, apart from the field theory and the stability analysis, one uh, could uh, uh, try to develop a similar algorithm for five-dimensional local, uh, localized rotating black holes. And uh, it would be very interesting if gravitational waves from black hole mergers could provide evidence for extra dimensions by distinguishing brain world solutions from the corresponding four-dimensional ones. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so, any questions? <clears throat> okay, well, um, I might ask uh, at least one. Um, you talked about the event horizon. I, I don't think you actually said what the topology of the event horizon was. That's it including extending into the bulk. Uh, is it is it like a sphere or is it topologically? It's, it's like uh, this, like a pancake. Uh, here you can see the free brain. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, sorry, I interrupted you. Uh, no, no, it's okay. Go ahead. Uh, you can see here the three brain. Uh, on the brain, the geometry is a Schwarzschild uh, solution, as we all know. And uh, there is this uh, exponential suppression along the extra dimension. The complete uh, description of the five-dimensional space-time is given by this line element. I don't know okay. if, yep. if I answered. Yeah, you did. I could see from the, that picture. Um, it, it's basically... Uh, a sphere in, in a sense, although in this diagram it's looking flat and... Um, uh, it, it, it is indeed flat. Uh, uh, it, it is indeed exponential suppressed. Uh, and uh, this is the relation which uh, gives this uh, suppression. Uh, here, RH is uh, the radial coordinate in which we encounter the, the black hole horizon and why not is um, the uh, how uh, how uh, how far are we from uh, the the three brain if why not equals zero rh equals the Schwarzschild value to m as we expect but uh, uh, as uh, y not increases, this, uh, this uh, right-hand side goes to zero exponentially fast. This is why we have uh, uh, this uh, topology. 
Okay, and just to finally, that other uh, diagram you had of the um, growth of the curvature in terms of um, curvature singularities, it looked like it was, yeah, it looked like in the right hand one, no, the, the one you just had up. Yes. The other, not, not that picture, the, the one showing the curvature singularities. Uh, here? Uh, no, it's a diagram. Uh, sorry. Uh. Oh, it's it's okay. We can <laughs> not that one. No, um, that one. Yes, ah, you passed. Okay. Ah, the defective theory on the brain. No, no. Yeah, well, you've passed it. It's, it's okay. I'll, we'll have to move on. But um, thank you very much okay. for, for that. Sure. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, so our next speaker is Indranil Chakraborty, <clears throat> and he's going to be talking about memory effects in Kunt geometries for Brand's Dicky gravity. Could you please share your screen? Yeah, so are my slides visible? Yes, they are. Okay. Okay, so hi everyone. I'm Indranil Chakraborty from IIT Kharagpur, India. So let me begin by thanking the organizers and the session chair. So the title of my talk is Memory Effects in Cone Geometries for Brands Deep Gravity. So it is done in collaboration with Siddhanta, a master student, and my supervisor Shankar at IIT Kharagpur. So the talk will be primarily based on this paper whose archive number is given over here. Okay, so very briefly, the plan of my talk is I will introduce memory effects, but most of the work has been done by Syed. So I'm thankful to him. So then I'll go on to discuss Kuhn geometries in GR, and then I'll go on to the main topic, that is main memory effects in Kuhn geometries for Brand's Dick theory. So this diagram has already been explained. So what I would like to emphasize is in memory effect, there is a permanent distortion. So a circle turns to an ellipse, and this distortion is there even when the wave has passed by. And this is what is called the memory. Okay. So from the source wave equation, this is also has been mentioned by Syed. From the source wave equation, the metric perturbation can be related to the double derivative of the quadrupole moment. And from the geodesic deviation equation, you can say that the change in separation delta xi i is proportional to the change in the double derivative of the quadrupole moment. So there have been many. So there have been many eminent relativists who have worked in this field whose name I have written, but this list is long. I have not mentioned many of them. So what I'd like to emphasize is that both this linear and nonlinear memory are DC effects, and there are predictions for detecting it using low frequency detectors like LISA. Okay, so now the main topic of Kuhn geometries. So the metric line element of Kuhn wave space time, which we have worked with, is like this. So there are non-vacuum solutions in GR, and they are not asymptotically flat. If you construct U equal to constant hypersurfaces, they are not planar because of the presence of matter or a cosmological constant. U acts as a sort of an affine parameter. Is coordinate u. So if you get, if you set p to one, you get back the well-known PPUF solutions. And in this kind of metric, p gives you a background curvature, and h is the gravitational wave component. Okay. So in our earlier work, which was published in Physics Letters B, we choose p so that the background is a constant scalar curvature space time. To be a solution of GR, we make it a vacuum solution with a non-zero cosmological constant. So if you set p to y, you get a constant negative curvature background, where lambda is minus half, and the background becomes a direct product space time of h2 times m11. h2 is the hyperbolic two space, and m11 is the Minkowski in one plus one dimension. If you set p to cos hyperbolic y, you get a constant positive curvature, lambda to be plus half, and the background is like this, h2 times m1. And the pulse profile, that is h, we take it as a sec hyperbolic square pulse with x square minus y square, generally taken as for plus polarization. Then we study the memory effects numerically solving the geodesic equation. So what is the general methodology for obtaining memory effects? You choose a pulse profile, which you have chosen like say hyperbolic. You solve geodesic equations for the Kuhn wave metric. You start with initial parallel geodesics, which suffer separation due to the pulse. The change in separation caused due to the pulse is a displacement memory. And if you differentiate the geodesic solutions, you get velocity memory. Okay, so for the first type of line element given over here, for h2 times m11, there is scalar curvature r is equal to minus 2. You see in these plots 
the separation gets permanently changed after the passage of the pulse. The pulse is located around mu equal to zero, both along x and y. But it is not for the velocity. It is initially zero and finally is zero. So there is no velocity memory, but there is a distinct permanent separation after the passage of pulse, which we term as constant shift displacement memory. What happens in the other scenario? The metric line element looks like this. The scalar curvature is plus two. And along x, you see a increase in separation, monotonically increasing separation. But along y, you see there is a new phenomenon, sort of an oscillatory motion is generated. And this is also reflected in the velocity plots. Thus, there is displacement and velocity memory along x, but a new phenomenon, which we term as frequency memory effect. There's an oscillatory motion is generated. So each geodesic has a particular frequency associated. So if you go to a variable negative curvature scenario, when there is non-zero matter content, how you go there? You choose P to be sec hyperbolic Y. The Ricci scalar now becomes negative always, but it is variable. So here also you see there is a permanent separation after the passage of the pulse. Initially it is something, finally it is changing. And also for Y. So thus it is qualitatively similar to the constant negative curvature scenario. So even when matter is present, that is T minimum not equal to zero, we find similar nature of memory. This frequency memory is also seen for different choice of coordinates that you go to a different gauge to find this frequency memory. So this led us to wonder whether there is a relationship between the memory effect with the background curvature. Is it only GR dependent? What about other theories? So this we examine in the simplest scalar tensor theory that is Brown's stick graph. So what we do in our main paper is to examine Kuhn geometric solutions. We choose two type of geometries, the Kuhn wave metric that I just now described, Kuhn metric with gyroton stunts. The second one is Kuhn metric with gyroton stunts. Then we'll analyze memory effect using geodesic equations as well as deviation equation. And then compare memory effects with the same omega, that is the Brown's stick dimensionless parameter with or without gyrotonic terms. Okay, so let me briefly go through the action which we work. And this is in the Jordan frame. And the relevant field equations are this, and we work in Brown's stick vacuum. Okay, so then other solutions. So the metric line element with including the gyroton terms look like this, where this W1 and W2 marked in red are the gyrotonic terms, and they're responsible for angular momentum, as was shown by Folov and Fusayev in their PRT paper. So if you set W1 and W2 to zero, you get back cool wave space time, as you can see. So you here is also an affine parameter. So what we'll do is we'll substitute this metric ansatz in the field equations of branch de gravity. Okay, so I will not go in detail through the solutions. What I would like to emphasize the main point is the phi is independent of the coordinate V and we employ this decomposition scheme, which is given in this rectangular bracket by decomposing it into U and XY dependent parts. So we get analytical solutions for every component except this H tilde U, which is the U dependent part of H and this J function, which is the U dependent part of W1 and W. Apart from that, we get exact analytical solutions. This H tilde and J are free functions of U, and they will be important when we discuss memory effects, as they will be responsible, as they will act as pulse profiles. For Kund waves, this J is always equal to zero, because you see, if J is zero, W1 and W2 are zero. Okay, so the Ricci scalar looks like this, if you calculate that. And the scalar curvature, that is the Ricci scalar, is independent of the gyrotonic term. And this is true for all the scalars. For omega equal to minus two, the constant negative curvature solution, you get a constant negative curvature solution. For omega not equal to minus two, there is a singularity. And such singularity is also obtained in the paper by Tahamkan and Schwitek, where the delta with scalar field is in GR. So now we'll go on to study memory effects using geodesics and geodesic deviation equation. Okay. So recall in GR, the H is given like this for non-zero cosmological constant with matter set to zero. And we obtain constant curvature space-time by choosing different P values, P functions. Even for non-zero matter, we obtain similar kinds of memory as was shown in the earlier paper. But here in Brown's dig, this H X Y is not X square minus Y square and is fixed from the field equation and is dependent on the scalar field. Here the scalar field gives an effective matter contribution somehow. Hence, only constant negative curvature solution is possible, not constant positive curvature. And this will have a bearing on the memory effect features. Okay, so now memory effect using geodesic equation. So the metric line element is this, we employ a coordinate transformation 
going from small x, small y to capital X, capital Y. And the metric line element is now like this. But this H tilde is the free function, which will act as the pulse profile. And this capital X, this capital X coordinate is related to the scalar field Psi. Psi is the X dependent part of the scalar field. So thus there is a scalar field imprint in the matrix solution also. So the geodesic equations for X and Y are this. So if you start with Y dot to zero, we'll find that Y dot is zero for all values of field. So thus the non-trivial equation is only for coordinate X. And we only obtain for omega equal to minus two analytical solution. For other values of omega, they are numerically solved. So we have to solve X to get scalar field memory effect because X is related to psi. So a little detour for the other scenario where omega is not equal to minus two, you can do this transformation from X to Q and you are left with the forced system, which is known as the forced levinson smith system given over here. But this forcing term is given by this pulse H tilde U. So earlier results linking force systems with memory effects was also done by Braginch and Grishu. Okay, so for the omega equal to minus two scenario, the Ricci scalar is R equal to minus eight. We obtain a constant negative curvature. The geodesic equation looks like this. And the pulse profile is this, where we take it as the sick hyperbolic square pulse. And we get an analytical solution. X is like this. So initially two geodesics, which start at U equal to minus infinity, have X1 equal to X2 to zero. But finally, at U tending to plus infinity, X1 minus X2 is A1 minus A2 which in general can be non-zero. And this is the memory effect. So as seen from this figure, initially they start from zero, but finally they have a permanent separation. And this is again a constant shift displacement memory, which is much like GR, but here it is induced by a scalar field. What happens for omega equal to plus two? The Ricci scalar looks like this, and it is a variable positive curvature for X greater than zero. Note that there's a singularity here, X equal to zero, but we have restricted our analysis in the domain X greater than zero, but the space time has an overall positive curvature. We solve it numerically, and you see from the plot there is a monotonically increasing separation, but no frequency memory. And this difference is due to the difference in the metric function H, as I highlighted earlier. And this can be in turn due to the difference in the field equations between GR and Bronstein. Okay, so what happens for the gyroton terms? The metric line element law looks like this, where you have this J term. We employ the same coordinate transformation we end up with a metric like this, where this J is present, which is the gyrotonic pulse. So if you now write down the geodesic equations, they are like this. I see the first integral of Y dot contains J U. So you cannot set Y dot to zero because J is non-zero. So the evolution of Y coordinate is only due to the gyrotonic pulse J U, where we take J U to be sick hyperbolic again. So now we plot the results for the omega equal to minus two, it is my R equal to minus eight, and we get constant shift displac displacement memory but we also obtain an evolution along y, and these are obtained numerically. For omega equal to plus one also, you see along x there is monotonically increasing separation, and along y there is a variation. And along y, you see that the diatonic pulse is centered at u equal to zero. That's why there is a significant contribution. So these are also obtained numerically. Okay, so now the last part, using geodesic deviation, we'll understand memory effect. So why deviation equation? Is geodesic memory effect not sufficient? No, because the separation, from the geodesic equation comes from both contributions. It is a contribution from curved background as well as from the wave. But traditionally, the memory is defined as the separation only due to gravitational wave. But geodesic equation being nonlinear, this decomposition is not possible. The geodesic deviation by virtue of being linear, this decomposition is achievable. So how we'll do it? We'll go to a Fermi basis. So deviation equation in coordinate basis looks like this. Along a geodesic, one can set the crystal connection always to zero. You construct a parallel transported tetrad like this, where the Greek letters denote space-time index, the Latin denotes the Fermi index, and this E mu zero is the tangent vector, which satisfies the geodesic equation. And this tetrad and metric are related like this, where G is the metric and metric tensor, and eta is the Minkowski unit. Okay, so what is the general methodology? So the deviation vector in coordinate basis is given by psi. You can take it to Fermi basis, ZI, via this relation. And the deviation in Fermi basis can then be related, uh, can be written down as this, which is nothing but the deviation, which is nothing but a Jacobi equation. So now you decompose this ZI into ZIB and ZIW, right? You can also split the Riemann tensor into its background and wave parts. How do you decompose it? 
the Riemann tensor for the wave part will contribute, will contain terms which are proportional to H tilde, that is the pulse profile or its derivative. So after doing this, all this splitting, you substitute it into this equation for the Fermi basis deviation, you get two separate equations, one for the background and another for the wave. The wave, the background evolution is when there is no pulse. So after solving this background and wave equation in the Fermi basis, you again go back to the coordinate basis via this relationship. Right, even in here. So you get a separate deviation, psi mu b, that is coordinate deviation along background, coordinate deviation along wave, and then you add them, and then you match them with the geodesic analysis results. For guided tons, you decompose for three terms, the background wave and the guided ton. Here the guided ton will contain terms proportional to the guidetonic pulse, J u or J derivative of u. Um, five minutes to go. Okay, I'll wrap it up in two minutes. So now for the Kuhn wave space time, we solve it. So for the orthonormal tetrads, uh, we construct orthonormal tetrads, which are like this. So E1 and E2 parallel, uh, perform parallel, does not par perform parallel transport, but they are given a rotation to make them parallelly transport. But this rotation is theta. So this theta dot is proportional to Y dot. And from geodesic equation, we know for geodesic analysis, from geodesic analysis, this Y dot is zero for Kuhn wave space time. So theta is constant, which we take as zero. So the Riemann tensor in tetrad frame for any general omega in Kuhn wave space times is given over here, where you see this for the wave, it is proportional to H tilde term. Okay, so now we do it for omega equal to minus. So we obtain analytical results, X and Y dot, these are the central geodesic. We substitute the omega equal to minus two in the values of this Riemann tensor. And we find that only 2020B and 2020W contribute. They are non-zero. Thus, there is only non-trivial evolution only along Z. And we solve these Z2 equations analytically in terms of hypergeometric functions. Okay. And after obtaining all this Z, we go back to coordinate basis by the relation. And then we plot them. So you see from this figure that along X, you see a total deviation, which is much more than the memory. The memory contribution comes from the gravitational wave part, the blue part. And the total deviation is Y. Along Y, you see that there is no deviation as we saw from geodesic analysis, right? But there is a contribution of memory. For omega equal to plus one, we obtain numerical results. You see here there is increase in deviation, but there is no change in along Y. Thus, the geodesic analysis captures the total deviation, something more than the memory effect. So the gyrotonic wound we observed in the orthonormal tetrads, but here this theta dot is proportional to Y dot. But since Y dot is proportional to the gyrotonic pulse, Theta is not equal to zero, can't be set equal to zero. So after obtaining all these results, we solve them and we plot them numerically. And you find that these results for the total deviation is in perfect correspondence with the results from the geodesic analysis. Okay, so let me summarize. So we obtain novel Kuhn space time in Brown's wave theory. This H tilde and J U are localized pulse profiles. They help in understanding the difference in the change in separation before and after the onset of the pulse. The memory in Brown's date is dependent on both phi and omega, which is an intrinsic difference with GR. The geodesic analysis somehow sees the total deviation, something more than the memory effect. The deviation analysis can be also done in coordinate basis, but the calculations are longer. That's why we went to Fermi and then again to coordinate basis. So some of the possible extensions for this work can be, we can find newer Kuhn solutions in Brunswick, or we can examine Kuhn geometries in other theories and understand the relations with memory effects. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I see we have a question from um, Syed. Would you like to ask your question? Yeah. Uh, uh, hi, Indralin, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Hi. Uh, thank you for the nice talk. I just wanted to ask. Uh, so first of all, when you are going to this branch decay theory, so this presence of the scalar function, it sort of enhances the memory effect or uh, just can you comment on that? I could not follow. So the, the, scale, the scalar field changes all the metric functions. So in mm -hmm. GR, you had this, so in GR, right. So in GR, you had this H to be sec hyperbolic square pulse time X square minus Y square times hmm. T. But in hmm. branch D, what happens is this H is something different. And that's why this relates to the memory effect. So the memory effect will all only depend on the metric, right? Hmm. So since the metric is different, that's why the features of memory effect are different in branch D. From so, it, 
uh, different as in so it is increasing the so see, displacement you see, you see or here, just, yeah 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 so you see here in the metric line element you have a log 2x term and mm -hmm. u square right mm -hmm. but in the uh, gr scenario in the gr scenario the metric had this x square minus y square term. Mm -hmm. So okay. that's how the geodesic equations gets differed, and then that has a bearing on the memory of the features. Mm. Ah, okay, oh, thank you so much. Okay, thank you so much for your talk. And can I please ask you to, to stop sharing your screen? Yeah. Okay, our next speaker is Renan Mahalis, who's going to speak about scalar configurations in quadratic Palatini gravity, the persistence of wormholes. Uh, hello to everyone. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can see your screen. Okay. Uh, first of all, thank you for the opportunity to, to talk here today. My name is Renan Magalhães, uh, and today I'll talk about scalar configurations in quadratic Palatini gravity, the persistence of wormholes. Uh, I'm a PhD student at Federal University of Pará, and this work was made in collaboration with uh, Gonzalo Olmo and Luis Crispin. Uh, here is a brief outline of the presentation. Uh, the, the recent gravitational wave detections in the first image of a black hole shadow provide new channels to test the gravity in the strong field regime. Uh, many gravitational extensions of general relativity will be put to experimental tests in the next years uh, using the present and the future gravitational wave data. Uh, and among the alternative theories, is it is interesting to analyze gravity theories formulated a la Palatini, which were much less explored in the literature compared with uh, metric theories. Uh, the analysis of Palatini gravity um, has been almost ex exclusively concentrated in the Lagrangian because it is very difficult to solve their dynamical equations. Uh, however, recently it was shown that uh, there exists a correspondence between the space, uh, the space of solutions of uh, Hitch-based gravity and the space of solutions of uh, general relativity, such so that one can consider a problem of Hitch-based gravity and mapping this problem into general relativity, then use the standard techniques of GR and, and solve this problem. And fortunately, the inverse problem is also true. And one can, by passing from a general relativity solution, uh, obtain new configurations in alternative theories. And this is basically what you do today. Uh, we will construct this map to uh, a particular model, f of r, q, and we will obtain new configurations in, in these uh, in this theories. Okay, so let's talk about the framework. Uh, here we will consider the family of modified gravities, uh, gravity theories described by the action one. Uh, and here the Matt de Lagrangian is a, a natural function of the, the Hitch scalar and the Hitch squared scalar. Uh, here we will consider the Palachin approach uh, so that the metric and the affine connection will be treated as two independent fields and performing a, a, variation, a variation of the action one with respect to these two fields, we obtain uh, an equation for the metric where T mu nu is the stress energy tensor and an equation for the affine connection. Uh, we can uh, here write the equation for the affine connection introducing an auxiliar metric. And the relation between the auxiliar metric with the space-time metric G is given by uh, these two relations here. Uh, this, uh, this matrix omega here is the deformation matrix and, and in general, it is not a conformal factor. Okay, we can also rewrite the, the metric equation introducing this uh, contraction between the space-time metric with the Hitch tensor uh, to obtain the equation nine. And the left-hand side of this equation basically depends on the Hitch tensor for the auxiliary metric times the, the square root of the determinant of the deformation matrix. And using this structure here, uh, one can derive the, the Einstein tensor uh, for the auxiliary metric given by, the, given by this equation here. The left-hand side of this equation basically is the, the usual equations of general relativity for the auxiliary metric. Uh, but the right-hand side of this equation depends on the matter sources and uh, the, the model. Uh, we are interested in to find solutions to, to this equation but to directly integrate this, uh, 
this this equation is not uh, is not in general a good option because the right hand side of this equation depends on the space time metric rather than the auxiliary metric. But as I said recently, it was shown that there exists a correspondence between the space of solutions of heat based gravities and the space of solutions of general relativity. And the key idea is to rewrite the, the previous equation, uh, rewrite the, the right hand side of the previous equation, uh, and, and write it in terms of uh, a Mad Lagrangian coupled to the uh, auxiliary metric. Here, uh, T tilde is the stress energy tensor. Uh, associated with the Mendel Lagrangian coupled to the auxiliary metric, and it is related to the uh, stress energy tensor uh, associated with the uh, scalar uh, with the uh, space time metric by the equation 13. Uh, and now uh, we have this equation 12 here that is a usual Einstein's equation, and one can solve it uh, for a given. Uh, stress energy tensor to tilde and once obtained a solution to, to this equation here uh, using the standard techniques of, of general relativity can, one, one can use the the equation five that gives the relation between the space-time metric and the auxiliary metric to obtain new configurations in, in alternative theories. Uh, here we will consider this procedure to generate uh, scalar configurations in f of r q. So we we will basically consider the inverse problem. We have a Mad Lagrangian coupled to the auxiliary metric. The the Mad Lagrangian is coupled to general relativity. Here is the kinetic term associated to it, and we will find a Mad Lagrangian uh, capital F uh, coupled to the space time metric. And if this equation here uh, is satisfied, then our goal of mapping the dynamics of f of r q. Uh, into GR coupled to a scalar field will be accomplished. So let's construct this, this map. And uh, here, the, the T mu nu is the, is the stress energy tensor coupled to the, uh, coupled to the F of RQ theory and takes the form given by the equation 15. Uh, unfortunately, today, I don't have time to show all the steps to, to make this procedure, but this uh, tensor here, X mu nu, has this important property that uh, is very useful in our calculations. Uh, okay, analogously, uh, we have the T tilde uh, energy moment to tensor that takes the form given by the equation 17. And uh, using this stress energy tensor and the previous, in the previous one, uh, we can find these two uh, equations here. And using these two equations, uh, we can construct a relation between the Mad de Lagrangian capital F and the Mad de Lagrangian capital K. But uh, unfortunately, we need to, to we need, uh, it, it is not uh, this, uh, although we have this, uh, this relation between the capital F and capital K, we need also to determine the, the, the curvature scalars uh, present in the Mad de Lagrangian and the deformation matrix in terms of the, in terms of the, uh, the kinetic terms. So after some calculations, we find that uh, the, the curvature scalars, capital R and capital Q, uh, satisfy these uh, two equations here. And to determine the deformation matrix, uh, we, we want to determine the deformation matrix to have a relation between the kinetic term capital Z and the kinetic term capital X. And after some calculations, we find that the, the components of the deformation matrix uh, are given by this equation here. And the, the determinant of this equation is given by the equation 27. And using these two equations, we can uh, find the relation between the, the capital Z and capital X. And now we have all the equations to, uh, to obtain new solutions of f of rq. Uh, now let's apply it to a, 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 a model and see uh, how it works. Uh, Today, the, the seed metric we will consider is the, uh, the metric of the Wyman spacetime. Uh, this line element describes the asymptotically flat spacetime generated by a static spherically symmetric scalar field configuration, uh, assuming general relativity coupled to this Mad de Lagrangian here. Uh, this unusual uh, spherically symmetric uh, 
line element uh, gives uh, gives uh, this simple uh, uh, field equation for uh, in terms of the the radial coordinate y. Uh, this radial coordinate here is zero at the space infinity and infinity at the center of the solution. The Wyman space-time describes a uh, uh, naked singularity. Uh, here we plot the the area uh, radius for for this uh, for this metric here, and as you can see, uh, the the uh, area radius uh, diverges as uh, y is equal to zero and goes to zero. Uh, when y goes to infinity. Okay, so uh, the choice of capital K, the, the Mad Lagrangian, uh, being equal to uh, capital Z, uh, leads to some simplifications. The, the Mad Lagrangian coupled to the f of rq uh, is now given by the equation 30. And uh, this leads to a simplification in the finite of, of beta square uh, that appears in the, in the relations of the capital R and capital Q. Uh, that now is given by uh, the equation 31. And using these two equations here, uh, we, we find that uh, the curvature scalars, capital R and capital Q, now are simple, uh, simply given by these two expressions here. Okay, uh, today our target, uh, hitch based gravity, for implementing the mapping is the quadratic f of rq given by the, the equation 33. And contracting the, the metric equation with the space-time metric, we obtain the, the equation 34, that, that is a, a differential equation for the, the capital R. And one can solve this equation to find uh, the equation 35, where we, we find that the, the curvature scalar uh, is linear on the uh, kinetic term capital X. Uh, and we can use the previous equations uh, to, to find that this integration constant here is equal to the coupling uh, constant of the theory. Okay, so uh, now we have uh, how the, the curvature scalar depends on the kinetic term, and we, we, and we have how the, the kinetic term uh, capital Z that depends on, on the kinetic term uh, capital X. And this is a, a cubic equation, and in general, it has three different roots that uh, I, I show here. And uh, depending on the choice of the parameters A and B, we, we need to consider uh, one of, of these uh, roots here to be the, the solution. Uh, we, we consider positive and, and real uh, X of Z solutions. Uh, so looking for positive X solutions and considering that uh, B is uh, positive. Uh, today, we we'll, we'll, uh, consider only solutions with uh, positive values of B. And positive values of A, we notice that the kinetic term capital X is uh, unbounded and can diverge, uh, and can diverge uh, as we increase the value of the, the kinetic term capital Z. Uh, however, when we consider the negative values of, of A, uh, the kinetic term capital X is bounded from above. And this is interesting because uh, the curvature scalar uh, is, is uh, linear on, on the kinetic term, so that in, in this scenario, the curvature scalar can diverge, and in this scenario, the curvature scalar is bounded from above. Okay, uh, after we, we uh, apply the, the previous equations in the seed metric, we will basically find uh, a new uh, configuration in, in f of rq. And this configuration will be, uh, will be coupled to this uh, Mad Lagrangian here. And here we can uh, notice an uh, uh, interesting uh, feature of this mapping procedure. The, no, the nonlinearities of the gravitational sector are, are carried to the to the matter sector. As you can see here, we have a uh, uh, nonlinear dependence on the kinetic term capital X. Okay, so uh, applying, applying the, the map, basically uh, using the equation five, we find that uh, the, the scalar configurations in f of rq coupled to this uh, matter Lagrangian are now given, uh, uh, has this, uh, this functions, these metric functions here. 
and to visualize which kind of, of uh, space-time uh, this metric can, can describe, uh, let's analyze the uh, area radius of these solutions. And for positive values of A, uh, the area radius uh, has, a, a, has the same behavior of, of general relativity at, as Y uh, uh, approaches to zero. And when Y uh, uh, is increased, the, the, the behavior of the area radius uh, is, is changed. Uh, um, five minutes to go. Okay, thank you. Uh, it's important to notice that different from general relativity, uh, now the, the center of the solution is written at a finite value of the Y code range. Uh, the, the field associated to this solution now has a, a maximum at, at the center and is concentrated it, it the, the, uh, inside the, the region of 2M. And this M here in the Wyman uh, space-time has the interpretation of the Newtonian mass of the solution. Okay, uh, this is a standard configuration of scalar field in, in, in f of rq. And when we consider uh, the a equals zero, we have, uh, again, a standard configuration with uh, uh, a curvature uh, divergency at, at the center. And, and again, the, the center of the solution is reached, reached uh, much earlier for, for y compared with the, the Wyman space time. But when we consider negative values of A, we have uh, a very different uh, behavior. The area uh, radius now uh, present a minimum. And this indicates the, the, that this space time is a wormhole. And, the, and this minimum here uh, indicates the presence of a throat. Uh, and as we can see here, uh, this, throat, uh, this throat location depends on the, on the choice of the parameter B. Uh, as we can see, uh, the throat location is always uh, smaller than uh, a Chivashud radius of a, a Chivashud black hole with the same mass. Uh, and, and to finish, uh, how the deformation matrix is, uh, is not in general a conformal factor, uh, is it, it is interesting to analyze the geodesic structure cause the, the, the geodesics of GR may be quite different from the geodesics of F of RQ. And considering the geodesics of the wormhole case uh, and in the standard uh, scalar configuration case, we notice that uh, in both scenarios, the space time is uh, geodesically incomplete. Uh, in the wormhole case, after uh, crossing the throat, the geodesics uh, goes to infinity in a finite value of the uh, affine parameter. And in, in the standard case, the geodesics uh, end their lives at the, at the center of the solution in a finite value of the uh, affine parameter. Uh, here is a, is a table just to, to summarize the, the results. Uh, by parting from a general relativity solution with these uh, features here, we, found, uh, we find a uh, standard configurations with divergent uh, kinetic and curvature scalars and wormhole configurations with bounded and uh, kinetic and curvature scalars. Okay, here uh, are some final remarks. We basically constructed a map uh, based in previous approach to obtain new configurations in F of RQ. Uh, we considered the Wyman uh, solution as a seed and we obtained scalar configurations uh, wormholes and compact balls, the standard uh, scalar configurations. Uh, here are some perspectives. We want to, to obtain this uh, map procedure to other uh, field configurations. So here are some references and thank you everyone. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Let me <clears throat> first of all ask if um, there are any questions from the audience. Sorry, I'm losing my voice, I think. <clears throat> okay, I want to ask one. Um, in terms of gravitational wave detections, um, for instance, say in a binary black hole system or something, how are we going to see this difference? How are we going to look for this difference? Is it going to be in terms of um, the horizons and 
therefore looking at the signal to see, you know, how far it, it extends before we have coalescence or how do you imagine that's going to happen? Uh, actually, this, this solutions here uh, can, can be black hole mimickers, right? And, and, and can have the, the same behavior of, of uh, black holes and, 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 and some uh, astrophysical objects. But I think that uh, these solutions here are, are more interested in the cosmological scenarios uh, rather than in, in astrophysical ones, cause uh, cause the 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 field configurations uh, that generate these solutions uh, has this uh, peculiar form here, and this peculiar form is is uh, much explored in cosmological cases. I, I I don't know how to to have a uh, a, a, a measure of the, the how to interpret um, some measures of gravitational waves and, and to, to notice uh, some difference from these space times and, and see with these space times, you know. Okay, well, thank you very much. That's probably something uh, that needs to be thought about in the future, but uh, that's a very interesting talk. So if you wouldn't mind to stop sharing your screen, please. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, well, our final speaker for the session is Daniele Gregoris, and he's going to be talking to us about thermodynamics of shearing massless scalar field space times is inconsistent with the Val curvature hypothesis. Good morning, everybody. I think that uh, you can hear me and you can see my screen. Now. Yes. Okay, perfect. So I come from Jiangsu University of Science and Technology. My talk will be based on the following space-time metric. You can see that it describes an expanding spherically symmetric and inhomogeneous space-time. The metric comes with the three with the two topologies, so it can be either closed and open. And uh, it is based on three free parameters, which are C, A, and B. Also, we have this function of the time, H, which is a sort of scale factor. Also, you can see that in this metric, only the angular part is time expanding, but the radial part is not. And the scale factor, H of T, is assuming different form according to the topology. This metric is an exact solution of the Einstein field equations of general relativity. And it is supported by a perfect fluid. And this is the equation of such a fluid. So we have a piece which is this of so equal to excuse me is it, is anybody else having trouble hearing um the audio yes Yes, I think it's not working. Yes, problems also. So this comes back energy because uh, you can see the pressure can be different from the matter. The model would. Okay. Excuse me, Daniele. Um, hello. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? We're having problems with your audio coming from your end. Um, none of us can 
understand what you're saying because the the audio connection is not good. Can you hear me? Very poorly, very poorly. The only thing I can suggest is that you disconnect and connect. No, we can hear you, but it's very poor quality. Okay, we're just waiting for him to try to um, reconnect. Did anybody notice at the start, I think he was at a Chinese university, is that correct? Yep. Okay, so maybe it, it's just bad connection at the moment. We'll give him another couple of uh, minutes to see if he can reconnect. Um, I suppose it's fortunate that this has only happened in the at the end of the session, um, but hopefully he can get back on. I don't see him. Well, <clears throat> this is unfortunate, but um, <clears throat> it would seem that he can't, isn't able to reconnect presently. So um, I think we're going to have to take the decision to um, end the session so that you're not all um, kind of waiting there indefinitely. Let me come back on screen. So thank you for everyone, all the speakers. Uh, it's been a very interesting session from my point of view, and I hope it has been from yours as well. Um, we look forward to the second session, which is on Friday. And um, hopefully some of you will be able to attend that as well. So 
uh, I will close the session and thank you everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. See you on Friday. Uh, thank you. Thank yes. you, everybody. Bye bye. Thank you.